I'm Tisha Bader. As we continue to cover the situation in Israel and the war in Gaza, we take a look today at UNRWA, the United Nations Relief and Works Agency set up for the Palestinians in Gaza, which announced just this past Friday that it had fired several employees accused of taking part in the October 7th Hamas massacre. The United Nations saying that it will conduct an urgent and comprehensive independent review of UNRWA in light of the allegations and funding to UNRWA has been frozen by a number of countries, including the United States. Well, to give us a better understanding of the situation is Avi Mayer, immediate past editor-in-chief of the Jerusalem Post. Avi also previously served as the international spokesperson for the Jewish Agency for Israel, and he joins us now from Jerusalem. Avi, thank you so much for being here. We appreciate it. Thank you, Tisha. So before we get to what's happening today and in recent days with UNRWA, can you just give us a little background why this body was set up and for what purpose was it meant for? Well, Tisha, the Palestinian people are the only people in the world who have a designated refugee organization that is just for them. That organization is UNRWA. It was established in the aftermath of Israel's War of Independence when hundreds of thousands of Palestinians were displaced. Many of them fled uh, as a result of the warfare. Um, Others uh, were told to leave by uh, Arab armies who were invading, and they found themselves in surrounding countries, and this organization came into being. Now, in the eyes of Israel and its supporters, that very notion of an organization, an agency that's dedicated to only one group is itself problematic, but the mandate of that organization makes it even more so. In the eyes of many, the organization called UNRWA exists not to end the Palestinian refugee problem, but rather to perpetuate it. So whereas other refugee organizations and other uh, bodies in the world exist in order to ensure that refugee populations are absorbed into their local communities and countries, become citizens, and their refugee status is terminated, Palestinian refugees not only are able to hold on to their status, regardless of whether or not they become citizens of other countries, but they can actually bequeath it to their children, which is how that number, several hundred thousand, has ballooned to millions around the world who claim refugee status and fall under the mandate of UNRWA from 1949 until the present day. And UNRWA has been problematic, um, as we've seen over the years. And we're not just talking about since October the 7th. We're talking about years of complaints of reports on um, wrongdoings as far as educational materials that are provided in UNRWA schools. Talk a bit about the history of the last however many years where there have been signs at UNRWA that not the best things are happening there necessarily. Look, UNRWA has long been a part of the problem, not the solution. Incitement to violence, to anti-Semitism, the delegitimization of Israel's very right to exist, exists in the textbooks it uses to educate Palestinian children. Its facilities and infrastructure have been used by terrorist organizations for years. This has been documented time and time again for at least 15 years by organizations like UN Watch and others that have taken this evidence and brought it to the United Nations and said, You have to deal with this, and they've been consistently ignored and smeared. Um, We know that members of UNRWA have also been members, active members, operatives of terrorist organizations. That, too, has been documented, and that has been ignored by the leadership of the United Nations. Um, And this is, of course, not a new problem. As you say, this has existed for many, many years, but it seems as though this, in many respects, was the straw that broke the camel's back. The allegation that, in fact, has been proven in a dossier that was circulated to these governments, that about a dozen UNRWA employees were directly involved in the October 7th massacre, that about 10 percent of the the employees of UNRWA in Gaza are themselves active operatives of Hamas, Islamic Jihad, and other terrorist organizations, and that roughly half of all of UNRWA's uh, employees in the Gaza Strip have some connection familial connection through immediate relatives to these terrorist organizations, I think that's ultimately what drove these dozen and more countries to, in fact, suspend their funding and say something's got to change. And you say the straw that broke the camel's back. I mean, that's a scary um, increase or a step to go from even inciting violence, which is horrible and which has, of course, great weight to it, 
to then members of UNRWA actually allegedly participating in the kidnapping of human beings, in physical harm to other human beings, it is truly, I don't want to say, um, you know, what happened on October 7th was shocking. End of story. But that step to be taken is is beyond disturbing, of course. Yeah, I mean, when you look at who these UNRWA employees are, half of them were teachers. These are people whose job it is to educate children. They participated actively in the murder, the kidnapping, the abduction of these Israelis. We know that two of them, one and uh, I believe one of their children, um, was involved in actually taking the body of an Israeli civilian into Gaza. And we know that others were involved in conveying weapons that day. Um, there is extensive evidence of this. The Israeli military and intelligence apparatus was able to cross-reference their phone records and identify that a certain number of them were actively in Israel that day. They were actively participating in the massacre in these kibbutzim that morning, um, and that others played perhaps supportive roles, but all of this is well documented. These governments would not have taken such dramatic steps if they hadn't been presented with ironclad proof. And that, in fact, is what we have of these operatives' involvement in the massacre of that day. And you mentioned UN Watch, Avi. Um, Hillel Neuer, who's the head of UN Watch, and you've, and you've shared um, recently his testifying to Congress about um, UNRWA and his years of work and presenting documentation, as you mentioned earlier, of a number of of things that UNRWA um, has done. And UN Chief Antonio Guterres saying he was shocked by the allegations presently, and Hillel Neuer saying he shouldn't be shocked. We've been showing him this systemic problem for years. You know, I'm reminded of that scene in Casablanca when the police inspector shows up at this underground casino. And he says, I'm shocked, shocked to find that there's gambling going on in this establishment. And someone goes over and says, uh, you're winning, sir. And he says, thank you very much. All of this is very, very clear. It's been clear for years now. Hillel and his team and others around the world have been presenting evidence, not only to United Nations, but to governments and other organizations that are involved in UNRWA's work and said, here is proof of the ways in which UNRWA has been tainted by terror for so many years. And up until this point, UNRWA and the United Nations have done absolutely nothing. One hopes that this will drive some kind of systemic change within the organization, perhaps a, a, a clearing of house. And if that doesn't happen, the time has come to look to other solutions to ensure that humanitarian needs in Gaza, which are real, are handled by organizations that are untainted by terror. Those organizations exist, including UN bodies that exist in, in uh, the Gaza Strip that have the mandate to serve those needs. They've done so in other places in the world. They can certainly enter a vacuum that would be created by UNRWA's dissolution, but something dramatic has got to change. That is the message that these governments are sending the UN. One hopes they take it seriously. And just uh, today, uh, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu said something similar. There are other agencies that can perform the tasks needed in Gaza. And he blatantly said Un UNRWA needs to be replaced. This is this is not tenable um, to continue an organization that has such um, such allegations against it, which you're saying there's very strong evidence to support, which is what we've heard from Secretary of State Antony Blinken, that the evidence is very is very strong indeed. So do you think that that is actually being considered now? And what would that look like in your opinion? I know that the pressure to replace UNRWA in Gaza is unprecedented at this point. You have legislatures around the world, chief among them, the U.S. Congress, who are increasingly calling for a serious review of UNRWA's role and its possible replacement. Um, and again, we know that there are bodies that do this work. Gaza is not unique. There have been other humanitarian situations across the world, and the UN has designated bodies. The UN uh, has a food agency. It has it has emergency aid organizations that are there in order to deal with these kinds of situations at times of warfare. Those can easily come into Gaza and engage in that work. UNRWA is not critical. We keep hearing it's a critical organization. These are just a few bad apples. These are not a few bad apples. This is an, an organization that has been entirely tainted by terror for so many years now. It plays an important role, but one that can easily be done by other organizations that are not tainted by terror in quite the same way. It seems now is the time for that to happen. 
And Avi, how do we prevent a, a new body from being, shall we say, infiltrated by Hamas? Because we know this terror organization um, you know, uses violent means to get what it wants in Gaza against its own people, uh, using its own people for human shields, taking food. We've seen um, video of Hamas members taking this humanitarian aid that comes into the Gaza Strip for themselves preventing it from going to Gazan civilians. So what kind of framework can be set up to make sure that that doesn't happen if UNRWA is in fact replaced to the next organization? Look, I think there are two fundamental steps that need to be taken. Firstly, former UNRWA employees and officials have admitted that they have no screening procedures to prevent members of terrorist organizations from infiltrating their ranks. That is preposterous. And that, of course, is how you have a situation like today, where one in 10 owner employees in Gaza alone are direct operatives of Hamas, Islamic Jihad, and other terrorist organizations. So those procedures have to be put in place. There cannot be a situation where the United Nations, which is directly funded by governments around the world, chief among them, the United States, is funding, paying the, the salaries of people who are on the payroll of Hamas and Islamic Jihad. So that's the very first step that needs to be taken. But more fundamentally, an organization whose mandate is to perpetuate a refugee problem rather than end it is one that is doomed to fail at the very beginning. You need organizations like the UN High Commissioner for Refugees, which exist in order to end refugee problems, to resettle the people who identify or have been identified as refugees and give them a new start in their new countries. That is what happens in every other refugee population around the world. That is what should happen here as well. The question of why there are people who are classified as refugees in the Gaza Strip is one that is important. That one wonders what has happened over the past 30 some odd years as this territory has been controlled by the Palestinian Authority to a large extent, why there are even people there who are considered refugees. That is a fundamental question. But in any event, the notion that there is a population that is should be privileged above all others, that should be able to bequeath the status to their children, and that should be remaining as refugees in perpetuity, that has to end. And any organization that comes in to fill the gap formed by UNRWA's dissolution needs to be one who has a very clear mission to end the Palestinian refugee problem, not to perpetuate it forever. Abi, I just want to look now at the big picture um which is which is a tough one these days obviously in israel it has been extremely difficult since october the 7th and things um are are continuing each day this this ongoing nightmare of the hostages being held in gaza of the idf's fight against hamas in gaza and i just wanted your take on in a few words and i know it's a lot where things stand now we have reports of potential hostage deals perhaps being worked out. Um, we don't want to report on anything that is not confirmed because this is a very sensitive um, negotiation and procedure. But how do you see things now at this moment? We're about 118 days, if I'm not mistaken, um, since the massacre. Look, we know that there are about 136 Israeli hostages still being held in Gaza. We don't know what their status is. We don't know what their condition is. We don't know how many of them indeed are still alive. And so many efforts are focused on bringing those people home. There have indeed been negotiations over the past few days and weeks in order to come at some kind of arrangement that would enable their return home, perhaps in several different stages. Um, there have been talks of a six-week pause during which the hostages and any bodies would be returned to Israel in, again, stages. And we understand now that Hamas is insisting that, that Israel withdraw entirely from the Gaza Strip as part of such an arrangement. Israel at this point refuses to do so, says that it will maintain its ability to be in the Gaza Strip and eradicate the threat posed by Hamas so it never can carry out a massacre like October the 7th ever again. That's where things currently stand. There's a very lively conversation, a debate within Israel about whether such an arrangement is even advantageous. Um, of course, all Israelis want the hostages brought home but at what cost? And I think that that is a question that many Israelis are asking right now, including members of the current government who have threatened to bolt the government and bring down Prime Minister Netanyahu if a lopsided hostage deal is in fact reached that would entail the release of thousands of Palestinian terrorists being held in Israeli prisons. The Prime Minister said that he will not allow such a thing to happen. It certainly remains to be seen. We hope that we can bring about 
the return of those hostages as soon as possible. Absolutely. It is so complex. It is so sensitive. It is so nuanced. Um, and as you said, also things happening in the government. Uh, we saw reports of Yair Lapid offering to join the government if Ben Gvir and Smotrich are out in order to give this sort of safety net to Netanyahu in, in regards to a possible deal. Is there anything that's happening in that regard at the moment, or is that just in the ether at the moment? Well, we don't know what's happening behind the scenes. It's certainly possible that there are all sorts of political machinations that are taking place. There have been other members of the government, uh, particularly on the right, who have said they prefer 10 uh, Ben Greers and 10 Smotriches over one Lapid, obviously a very hard line position. Um, Lapid, the leader of the opposition, has thus far refused to join the emergency cabinet, saying that it's just a fig leaf for Netanyahu and his, what he terms, extremist government. Um, but we will have to see what happens if indeed those members of the government who are opposed to a deal do indeed leave. Will Lapid come in in order to ensure that such an agreement can indeed move forward, essentially giving this government a little bit more breathing room and enabling it to live another day? And Avi, you talk a bit about this sort of dialogue happening in Israel right now, and I don't know if it's a division, um, if you would call it, as far as schools of thought, like hostage deal at any cost or not at any cost. And the the issue at hand, as you said, are these 136 hostages? Again, we don't know the condition of all of them, but we do know that time is running out and time is ticking away as we speak. And that is why I think it is in the forefront, so much so uh, for so many in Israel and around the world. Look, this is a gut-wrenching decision for Israel. And I certainly don't envy Prime Minister Netanyahu, who is really being pressured by so many different parties. If you look at prior examples, for example, um, uh, Gilad Shalit, the Israeli soldier who was taken captive by Hamas and who was released after Israel released over a thousand terrorists, many of those terrorists did in fact return to the circle of terror. And Yahya Sinwar, who is the leader of Hamas in Gaza, who has directed the October 7th massacre and has been directing Hamas's part in the warfare, was in fact one of those individuals who was freed as part of a, a, an exchange and a deal. Um, and so you have many Israelis looking at that precedent and saying, how can we risk another thing like that happening? How can we risk freeing these terrorists and enabling them to return to the cycle of violence and to the circle of terror? And so you have members of families, even of the hostages themselves, saying, it is painful for us to say this, but we would prefer that our loved ones remain in captivity rather than having Palestinian terrorists released. On the other hand, there is tremendous pressure within Israeli society to do whatever is possible to bring these people home. We're talking about small children, babies, elderly men, um, people of all ages, some of whom have chronic health conditions, um, some of whom were wounded as they were being taken captive on October the 7th. Um, and again, we don't know what their condition is. We don't know how many of them are still alive. As you said, it seems as though time is running out. And so the prime minister finds himself in the middle of these two schools of thought, these two massive areas of pressure. I certainly don't envy him. It remains to be seen what can be done in order to bring those hostages home. Well, Avi, I hope the next time we speak, and I hope sooner than that, I hope by today, by tomorrow, in the next coming days, we see the safe return of the hostages. We see our IDF soldiers staying safe and protected in what they need to do to decimate Hamas and just hope for better days ahead. And we, we truly appreciate your time. And what happens with UNRWA, as we uh, started the discussion with, as you said, remains to be seen, but happy to revisit that with you. Um, when uh, when things develop, as things develop. Thank you, Tisha. Avi Mayer is the immediate past editor-in-chief of the Jerusalem Post. He is an expert on the Israel-Hamas war. Joining us today from Jerusalem, Avi, thank you so very much. My pleasure.